Uh, good morning. Uh, I think we're probably all thrilled that we're not uh, down at the uh, Lubricants uh, and Oils Conference uh, downstairs this morning. Who knows, maybe it could be fun, I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, thank you very much, Alan. I, um, I'm not going to stick uh, totally to um, the brief. I'm going to talk about mixed-use developments, etc. cetera. Um, but I thought uh, I would just give you, um, and I think context is indeed uh, always uh, important. So um, I'll just give you a little bit of background in terms of, of what we do. Um, and I just, I wanted to show you this, this structure that you see behind you, which is uh, we have uh, a holding company which sits in Switzerland. And we have two interesting parts of our business. Um, so as was mentioned, we have a magazine um, which comes out 10 times a year. Um, then we do two newspapers uh, as well. And I know that yesterday a lot of the discussion was about doom and, and maybe sort of a little bit on the blue side. Um, I can tell you that uh, if you're in the business of cutting down trees um, and buying ink uh, and putting magazines out, it's um, supposedly, it's, it's quite gruesome. Uh, but I have to say, uh, when you have a single edition as we do, and you treat the entire world uh, as, as one market, uh, and I mean, what I mean by that is that we don't have regional editions of our magazine. Uh, we, we print down in pool, endorse it, uh, and then we spend a hell of a lot of money with Singapore Airlines and JAL and Cathay Pacific flying those magazines all over the world. It's one of the reasons why you'll also never, ever, ever see us do a green issue. Um, anyone uh, who, any publisher who tries to do a green issue should be put in jail because we are in one of the dirtiest businesses out there. Um, anyway, uh, I, I digress. Um, this is um, our magazine, uh, which uh, you will see on newsstands right now. And, and as was mentioned in the outset, we have a, a very strong focus on, on urbanism, uh, so much so that beyond what we do in the pages of the magazine, uh, about seven months ago, we decided that uh, we would do something different in the digital arena, and we launched a 24-hour radio station, which is called Monocle 24. Um, and one of our most uh, listened to programs is, is a show called The Urbanist, a one hour weekly program that looks at everything that makes cities tick or fail, uh, function brilliantly, uh, who are the people that you know, drive property prices in the right direction, who are the best people when it comes to securing cities uh, and looking after public safety. So the, the whole notion of, of, of the public realm uh, and, and the built environment has always been um, a big element of what we do. And, and this current issue uh, all, that uh, just came out on newsstand about 10 days ago is our biggest selling issue of the year because we do an annual quality of life uh, ranking where we look at the best cities uh, to call home. Uh, and it's, it's always quite interesting. We, we work with a series of metrics every year uh, and that starts with public health, uh, and we look at you know, basic things like how easy is it to set up a business. Uh, we, you know, so there's, there's a number of, of very sort of scientific measures that we look at. But other things that we have to do as well, which are not so scientific, is you know, the quality of housing. Uh, you know, we, we, we also look at you know, how easy is it to get a drink at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, in that city as well. All of those other things uh, that also might go some distance to improving your life. So uh, you can read about the full rankings, et cetera, um, but I'll give um, a couple of things away. Um, some of you might yawn, uh, but Zurich is, uh, is still an incredibly uh, good city, uh, does a number of things brilliantly, uh, and, and one of the reasons, you, know, you can look at sort of the top five or ten cities in the world, they all do a number of things very well, and, and we always have a very animated debate inside the magazine about what makes these, these places uh, you know, truly brilliant. Um, but one of the things we saw in Zurich, which is really fascinating, you know, the beating that the likes of UBS and, and really you know, the establishment of, of Swiss banking has taken has had an enormous impact in a positive way uh, on the, the children, the recent graduates uh, of all of those bankers from Julius Baer and Credit Suisse. You've seen an, an incredible level of, of entrepreneurialism now uh, in Zurich. So whether it is... It, and, and we're really talking about a very interesting startup culture, whether it's retail, uh, whether it's people setting up you know, their own restaurants. So traditionally, you, know, you came from a good family, you, know, you would go off and, and you would be a lawyer and you'd find yourself in a nice corner office working for Lombard Odier or somebody. Uh, those days are largely gone. Um, but I think what it's done 
is it's turned, that in, it's turned Zurich into a much more interesting city, also given the fact that it has you know, an extraordinary infrastructure, great public safety, great public health, um, et cetera. We, um, we gave um, Helsinki um, our number two position uh, this year, uh, partly for a number of interesting projects. And I'm sure some of you have been hearing about a development in Helsinki called low to no. So low, meaning low emissions to no emissions. Uh, and this is a very interesting development, part sponsored by the government, uh, of course, a number of private sector players, but absolutely brilliant. If you want to look at a mixed use model right now, which is focusing on how do you take recent graduates, how do you take an aging population, uh, and everything in between that. So looking at retail, uh, you know, people who, who need to work from home, people who need smaller offices, um, and absolutely, um, I mean, truly brilliant development which is going on um, in the harbor. The other interesting thing which, which is happening in Helsinki is how this is, you know, if you're flying westbound out of Asia, how they've really positioned that city from the point of view of its airport, how you really see this is becoming almost an Asian city within, within Europe. Uh, so not just proximity to Russia, uh, but you know, the amount of connectivity into Korea, into Japan, um, and into China. And third place, um, we, uh, we gave it to Copenhagen. The city's picked up awards before, but um, I wrote in the FT a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it's, it's just remarkable to be in a city, in and amongst some wonderful new developments that they've done around the harbor, but over the last decade that they've taken their harbor and made it completely swimmable. And so to be able to just see local residents going for a run in the morning, you know, pulling off the running tops of their sneakers and just jumping into the harbor in June, I mean, it's just a delight to see that you can take an area which was not swimmable, it was a complete you know, industrial wasteland, much of that harbor area, and has now become an incredibly vibrant community. So these are all of the elements uh, that we look at um, in the magazine and, and look at them from you know, a local and, and regional level, um, as much as also focusing on uh, you know, what happens in capitals, the role that, of course, central government has, uh, and then everything that bubbles up uh, from un underneath as well. We also like to dream uh, in the magazine, so uh, you know, oftentimes uh, you know, we, we like to have provocations and we also like to show if you were going to build a perfect mansion block, uh, and, and this is in a context of saying there's a huge opportunity in London uh, you know, at the moment, plenty of projects going up, none of them particularly good, uh, and, and very little happening um, down at, uh, at street level as well, and, and I'll talk about my hate of um, large plates of glass uh, in a moment, which uh, lots of developers seem to like, but they, uh, they absolutely kill life on the street. In the current issue, we look at what makes a, a perfect neighborhood, what makes a perfect community, uh, and all of the elements which make for a perfect high street. Now, you know, that could be in the context of a strip mall, um, but you know, it, it could also be a traditional street um, anywhere in the world. And so we've done this very much in a, ch in a very sort of childish storybook way, uh, but there's some very, very key points about what makes uh, an urban environment, a contained urban environment, a neighborhood function, um, and, and what doesn't. And, and this is just something we did a few years ago, looking at if you're going to develop a perfect uh, city block, so just an overview of, of, of what that could potentially look like. Um, and then we also do things like, you know, in, in this case, the perfect house, which was uh, in a recent uh, design issue. So that's what we do journalistically, editorially. Um, we also have a, uh, a branding and design agency as well, which is about 47 people uh, based between London and New York and Toronto, Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, and soon Bangkok um, as well. So based on all the things that we do in the mag with the magazine, and these are two totally separate companies, different floors, different ownership structure, et cetera, um, we've had a lot of people coming to us because we do these visions of what we think makes for a great urban environment. So we worked with Mitsui Fudasan, uh, on their five Hanover Square development. So doing all of the sales collateral, the branding for it, um, you know, even part of the positioning of what that development should be. Uh, we've been working with Swire in Hong Kong. This is the Frank Geary development, Opus, um, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. So again, the naming and the creation um, of all of the material uh, that goes to, of course, selling um, these rather expensive apartments. A lot of publishing work that we also do, so an expertise in doing magazines means that we do a lot of magazines for other people. So Shinsuke Department Store in Seoul, uh, Pacific Place in Hong Kong, uh, we publish their, their magazines for them. Uh, and you know, we've been looking at, at, at mixed use in Asia as well. So this is a, 
a little project uh, that we're thinking about uh, and helping someone with in, in Bangkok at the moment. Uh, we've been working quite a bit with the government in Fukuoka, uh, and this is a, a project in Hakozaki, so uh, uh, really helping them think through what they might do with a big chunk of the city. And then we also, we paint airplanes. Um, so when Swiss Air went bankrupt, we, we worked with them. Uh, and because we're also working very much in the public realm in the magazine, um, governments have been coming to us. So we, we started with working with Taiwan uh, about three years ago. So working on a completely uh, new brand, that heart that you see is, is part of, of a, a dynamic logo which can uh, constantly uh, change and evolve. And then, um, if anyone reads the FT or the IHT, uh, Wall Street Journal, you've probably seen some of these ads for Thailand uh, that have been running. This is part of a very a new campaign. So we work with the Prime Minister's office, or working with the Prime Minister's office in, in Bangkok. So that is the new logo for the country, uh, and this is uh, the first round of a major repositioning uh, of the country, and, and, and partly also just a refamiliarization um, internationally, the country being the biggest producer of, of, of eco cars. Um, and so these ads are sort of built around uh, manufacturing and, and hospitality and logistics and, and infrastructure. And then, you know, as the year moves out, uh, we'll be looking at, um, at other things. Um, I wanted to talk about um, mixed use and, and, and misuse today. Uh, and, um, and this is sort of really, um, I think, you know, part of the, the discussion. And maybe this can spark, um, I think, maybe some, some debate uh, perhaps later on. Um, in the day, and, and part of this has to do with just really rethinking the way we work, live, play, grow old. Uh, and you know, we spend a lot of time as, as editors and project managers uh, going around the world. Um, I travel about 250 days of the year, uh, and, and I'm always sort of fascinated, always looking at what makes, you know, why, why are people attracted to one side of the street or another? Uh, why does one building succeed where another one fails? Uh, so I have, um, they're not scientific, uh, this is just theories and ideas, uh, but it's, you know, mostly from about uh, 23 or 4 odd years on, on the road. I was in Toronto recently, I grew up, um, spent a, a good uh, part of my life in Toronto, and um, got the hell out as fast as I could um, in 1989. Uh, Toronto is, is a planning disaster um, as far as, as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, condominiums sort of just run wild. And, and I was mentioning earlier, I mean, these are, I think what all of these buildings would, would position themselves as, as being mixed-use developments. And uh, around Toronto's harbour front and downtown, you just have corridors, you know, corridor after corridor of, of, of condos with a bit of office, uh, with a bit of retail, but zero relationship to the street. Um, absolute canyons which have had you know, no thought in terms of light and, and shade, uh, the retail mix, et cetera. You know, are, are, they, are they selling well? Clearly, uh, because you know, it, it continues unabated. Um, but I do wonder whether people sitting in those condominiums are, are particularly happy. Are they engaged um, in their community? Um, are people actually living in those buildings is the other question. Um, so, of course, the whole sort of speculative notion of, um, of certainly a lot of Asian buyers going into the Toronto market um, and really no life on the street. So no life on the street in Toronto after 7 o'clock, you know, that means more policing. It means having to rethink, you know, lighting. It, re it means that you have to completely rethink the notion of, of what um, community is. So Toronto, not an example to look at. It's also one of the reasons why Toronto Toronto often does very, very well on the Mercer survey as a great place to live. It does, doesn't make it onto to our survey. Um, I think that this is, is just a really critical point. I mean, we are looking at, at so many cities at, at a choking point um, right now, um, and choking point for two reasons. Uh, aging populations in many developed economies, uh, and, and what does that mean in terms of how are you going to underpin and uphold uh, you know, the social fabric uh, and support structure in the future. Um, and, and at the same time, no matter all, you know, all of the different types of, of, of transport uh, initiatives that might be on the horizon, uh, they're just, they continue to be very, very difficult places to function. Nevertheless, uh, the draw of the city is, is not going to, to go away. Um, and that's why it's incredibly important right now to think about, you know, what does mixed use truly mean and, and what, what are the opportunities? So, I mean, to me, it's not about star architects, uh, and and you know that by that, of course, I mean star architects. 
uh, it's, you know, it comes down to, to good design. Uh, and good design you know, is not about attaching you know, a name of a wonderful stylist to a project, uh, but it's actually finding and commissioning somebody who is actually very good at reducing and, and making things function in their purest form. And I always say that you know, good aircraft designers, you, know, you don't add extra wings to the plane because they look nice. Um, in fact, what you, what you want to do is you want to take as much away from the aircraft as possible so there's no drag. Uh, so it is, it is more streamlined. And, and, and in that case, it just means function. It's built for great form and great function. Uh, and, and for those reasons, it's not always about going for uh, you know, the big, glossy, glittery name uh, when, when you're assembling a, a brochure or website. Um, and so that goes uh, you know, also you know, fancy names for buildings and, and the fas flashy branding. Um, it doesn't mean let's just get the most expensive stores in the mix, uh, but do you have great stores uh, that are relevant uh, you know, to what the daily metabolism of, of that community is. And, and I'm often amazed, uh, you know, particularly when you look at, at a lot of developments, you know, you know, in Europe as well, you think, okay, well, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful that you've attracted, you know, again, some, some big league tenants who are globally recognizable, um, but they're not of much use to me at, at 11 o'clock in the evening. Uh, in fact, they closed at 7. Um, it's not about you know, concierges and services that simply can't be delivered. I mean, I often look at when you see sort of brochures and websites promising new developments, and you think, are you really going to be able to deliver all of those things? Uh, you know, who is going to keep all the algae off of all of those pools? And are you going to actually end up draining all of those ponds um, in a very short span of time because they're simply not sustainable? Or you don't have the, no one ever budgeted for the, the actual services uh, and maintenance people to look after those things. Um, it's not about green reef rooftops either, uh, I think, when you think about uh, mixed-use developments. Um, but one thing I do believe, it, it is about intimacy, uh, because you are creating a community. Uh, and I think that's what we all want uh, out, of, out of community life, is that you want to be in an intimate environment uh, that you can relate to. And, and whether that is at 6 o'clock in the morning, or when you come back from you know, being on the road for two weeks, uh, or you come back from work at the end of the day. Um, it's a quaint term, but it's also about coziness. Um, it's about feeling enveloped, uh, not feeling isolated. And you know, I have a, I have a, you know, I have a small theory that uh, that social media, digital social media, is a creation of the U.S. West Coast. It's a creation of the United States, and it's directly related to all of those millions of people who are very, very lonely sitting in suburban America. Uh, they have, you know, maybe a strip mall 10 kilometers away, but I don't think we would see a Facebook uh, like we've seen right now and its uptake, uh, you know, particularly in the U.S., um, you know, if, if, you, if you didn't have such a poorly planned urban environment uh, and, and so many people weren't sort of stuck in dysfunctional communities. So people do crave intimacy. They crave coziness. You know, the, the third scene, all of that is, of course, they're looking for um, a sense of community. And within that, you know, a sense of place. Where am I? And I think this is, you know, incredibly important now when we're looking at the top end of the market where you have a more mobile society. People want to either visit or return somewhere and know exactly where they are. I was in Hua Hin a couple of weeks ago, and I just thought it was bizarre, you know, driving along the stretch of beach, you know, south of Bangkok, and, and everything was named after a Greek island, uh, and, and everything uh, looked like, uh, you know, there was like the Santorini this and the Mykonos that, uh, and, it, it, it was, and it was curious to see that, that those were products of probably 15 or 20 years ago, uh, and, and now how the vernacular um, was, was much more Thai. Um, and so it was about a sense of place. Um, so obviously there was someone who, you know, obviously had, you know, uh, a mistress or a wife or a partner um, who, or, or, or uh, who knows, or maybe there was, you know, some Greek people who own property down there um, and, and got off um, with a very good deal. Wouldn't happen today, though. Um, I think also the other thing, too, that we have to think about, you know, when we talk about these, you know, these, these canyon-style developments, and, you know, I'm, I sort of dread to, to think about... Um, you know, what becomes of, you know, we talk about sort of, you know, the environment, environmental impact of a lot of things happening all over the world, but if I look at a lot of Chinese cities, um, just the general sort of lack of thought, not with all of them, but many of them when it comes to, to development right now is, is quite frightening because you sort of wonder, are we going to be left with, I mean, real 
urban wastelands because you know something else, something better will come along, um, and you know environments are being built that people simply you know don't want to don't want to live in. So. Um, a couple of facts that, um, you know, which, which I think sort of ring true is that just, you know, many mixed-use developments fail because too much money is spent on the brochure and not enough money was spent on, on mature trees. Uh, and always people say, oh, well, it's going to grow into itself. And I think this is one, one area where the three M's of Japan uh, should be applauded, Mitsubishi, uh, Mori, and Mitsui Fudasan. You know, every time a Japanese development opens, I, I, can, I would love to sort of look at uh, you know, at the, at the budgeting when they actually come up with these things because they choose to actually bring in trees which are 60 years old as opposed to saplings which are about as high as this microphone which is kind of, you know, they're still trying to get those damn trees to grow, grow at Canary Wharf. Um, and, you know, and, and we see this, you know, time and time again. And there's a reason why, you, you know, you go into Tokyo Midtown, you know, the day that Roppongi Hills opened, I mean, it just felt integrated and, and like it had been there for a very long time albeit you know, rather large um, and, and quite massive, but yet the pavements met, the trees were mature, um, and, and there was a sense of, 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 of a scalable environment, and there was that sense of intimacy there from the very beginning. Um, I think when, you know, I think, and you know, as a result, I think it's a fact that you know, mixed-use developments you know, will universally fail you know, if there is no respect, you know, no respect for scale whatsoever. Um, I also think that whether you, you, know, you can draw an arc um, you know, from, from Sapporo you know, through this city all the way down to Sydney, and, and there's so much room right now uh, for someone to come up with you know, a confederation of properties um, that could work across a variety of places, uh, or they could be single use. Uh, but you know, this is just my punt at, I think, what's, what's required. Um, I think one is, you know, it's about offer, offering a, really a self-contained environment, but it has a relationship to its surroundings. Um, it's not about, you know, being sort of plunked down in the middle of an environment um, and then you sort of create this, this island or this gated community, uh, which, is, which is then within the urban core. Um, there needs to be life on the street. Uh, walls of glass uh, and, you know, it's interesting to Baker Street in London street which has been totally redeveloped, uh, you know, lots of shiny new glass buildings that have gone up. But it's just the same facade of just, you know, three meter glass panels all the way down the street. There's just, there's nothing interesting. It's cold, uh, it's not inviting, and, and no surprise as well that you actually, you know, in a very short span of time, you see this extraordinary turnover. So, you know, I think cities need nooks, and they need greenery, they need places to perch your bum, uh, and particularly as we, you know, we have an older society um, you know, upon us, these need to be places where you can linger uh, and where you can contemplate life uh, and where you can think about, you know, where do I want to go next within that environment, um, as opposed to being uh, an incredibly forbidding one. I think it's also about mixing it up. I mentioned the low to no development in Helsinki, which is interesting, but, but the idea of, of, of young and old and and I think when we sort of look at, at, at aging communities, uh, you know, it's not about having them sort of stuck out uh, in an old age home, uh, but you know, how are older people able to you know, take truly a nanny role looking after you know, the children of, of other young residents, et cetera. I mean, so there's, I think, a lot of, you know, and I say social engineering in, in a very you know, positive way, there's a lot of very interesting social engineering uh, that can go into these developments when you think about the mix. Um, Mixing it up part two is also just not going for the lazy, uh, big, obvious opportunities when it comes to, comes to retail. And that's about sense of place. Uh, I think you want to know, am I in Bangkok today? Uh, you know, am I in Osaka or, or am I in Dusseldorf? And, and that means also really trying to, to engage uh, you know, with, with small and independent businesses. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, I think outdoor space is, is a right and, and not, not a privilege. And you know, when you look at the great architecture of the Funkus movement in, in Sweden um, in the middle of the last century, I mean, even small one-bedroom apartment studios, everyone got a south-facing balcony. Um, and there is something magical uh, just a, about that idea of being able to open a door, um, you know, and we're not talking about even sort of low-scale developments. I mean, when the whole Funkus movement sort of took hold, of course, it was sort of this great socialist dream. Um, but, but, you know, now these do become incredibly expensive, you know, apartments as they're, as they're on the open market. And, and I think that, you know, not sort of 
and it comes back to good design. I think that you know everyone should be able to open their window or door, uh, and and hopefully, depending on what city you're in, uh, breathe some fresh air. Um, I'm very passionate about this from a you know an environmental perspective. Buildings can talk about all of the green initiatives that they're doing, but you know, please build something to last. I mean, I'm always amazed when you when you go into uh, you know a, a completely new property and. They've just put like white drywall up, up the stairwell, uh, and yet you know that it's a heavily trafficked building. Well, you know, suddenly the maintenance charge you know, has to go up because no one sort of thought that someone was going to be taking the Remova suitcase up the, up the stairs. Uh, they didn't put any, any, type of, uh, any type of paneling, et cetera. So immediately you've got scratches and dents, uh, and that thing has to be replastered. And yet, if you look at some of the, you know, just the great buildings and, and even look at you know, contemporary Swiss buildings that go up, I mean, chances are up the stairwells there will always be solid stone uh, because, you know, and, and no one is going to have to, to replace that. Uh, you're not going to have to ask for more money from your tenants or residents uh, because it was built to last the first time. And I think we all know about the um, environmental upside that, that goes with that. Um, I think also it's about designing spaces with sustainable services. Uh, so why should staff have to travel in you know, two hours from the suburbs? How do you actually look at allowing you know, staff to be resident in those environments as well? Rubbish should be sent down uh, chutes. You know, there should be a dog run. Uh, and you know, why shouldn't you be able to compost you know, the dog waste at the same time? Um, recognition uh, also being absolutely key. Very, very interesting report that's come out by the World Health Organization. Communities that have small businesses, meaning you own that shop, you own that shop, uh, and you're there every day, whether it's offering flowers or fish or newspapers, um, you recognize me as a customer coming in. There's a direct relationship between public health, um, so less sick days, longer living, uh, and daily recognition, because Something magical triggers in your brain when you go into a store, someone recognizes you on the street. Um, they see that you haven't come in for a few days. You know, I wonder where Miss, Mrs. Johnson is. I wonder where Mr. Lim is. You know, maybe someone should, should check on them as well. There's a whole body of work being done about how do you encourage small businesses, not big chains, but real mom and pop operations to be absolutely fundamental as part of communities. And, and I, I can't sort of stress enough, I think, how often this is, is overlooked. And I think the benefit, it's a little bit harder, of course, to go and find you know, that dairy stand uh, or maybe that news agent, much easier to go uh, and talk to WH Smith to bring them in. Uh, who are not even in the business of selling magazines anymore, by the way. They only sell chocolate bars. Um, it's, it's absolutely, I think, crucial uh, to be able to, to engage on, on that level. And, you know, and as I say here, you know, it's fine to welcome uh, you know, the mega tenants, but it's, uh, it's also important to, uh, to offer up um, space for cottage industries um, as well. And finally, I'll sort of leave it at, at this. Um, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, Good living is about having the maximum number of experiences across the day. And that means you know, having three good meetings, having time with your family, discovering a new store. Uh, and, and you can only do that uh, in, in well-designed de well, well and, and well-defined uh, environments. Uh, you know, it's the reason why you can get around Zurich very easily means you can have a number of experiences. Um, I'm not so sure about you know, quality of life in Seoul, for example, when you sit in your Hyundai, which is a copy of a Mercedes, um, and uh, you spend uh, five hours in traffic. So I sort of really believe it's, um, it's about challenging rather than um, cheapening. There's a minute and 22 seconds uh, if anyone has any questions. Thank you.